You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is December 19, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, angioedema. Our presenter is Dr. Veronica Lawrence. She's a pediatric resident at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. with a 10-minute talk on angioedema this morning by Va- uh, Veronica Lawrence, one of our um, second-year mm-hmm. um, residents rotating through a clinic with us. Take it away. Okay, thank you. All right, guys. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly today on angioedema. I chose this topic after doing my um, most of my allergy rotation this month. I've come to learn that for you guys, this is pretty bread and butter kind of um, stuff. But um, as we were going through, I realized I wasn't really as comfortable with this topic as I probably should be, seeing how commonly it occurs in the pediatric population. So um, just as an introduction, angioedema was first described about 425 years ago um, in about 1586 or so as a self-limited and localized swelling of subcutaneous and or submucosal tissues. It results from the leakage of intravascular um, contents, particularly particularly the capillaries and post-capillary venules into um, the interstitial tissue. Angioedema can be isolated. It can occur with urticaria, and from what I read, um, about 40 to 50 percent of urticarial cases are associated with angioedema. And then, lastly, it can be a component of the anaphylactic response. Excuse me. Um, so, just a short slide. I'm not going to talk a whole, whole lot on urticaria today. Another one of your guys' bread and butter. Um, but I did want to just kind of compare and contrast the two very quickly. Um, angioedema and urticaria are often viewed to be on a spectrum of the same clinical disease process as their etiology and clinical management um, are often very similar. And like we just talked about on the last slide, they oftentimes occur together. However, um, the two entities are really quite distinct from one another. Angioedema, um, as I learned this month, is going to involve your deeper layers of the skin. And I did have to take it back to med school reviewing the layers of the skin. But um, angioedema really involves the reticular dermis, whereas urticaria is going to affect the more subcutaneous tissues, your papillary dermis and your mid dermis. Pyridis, I've learned this month as well, um, is um, very much associated with urticaria, and like Dr. Dowling has told me, if it's not itching, it's not urticaria, it's not high. Um, and then with angioedema, this itching is um, often absent, or nearly always absent. Pain or tenderness are uncommon in urticaria, um, and this is something that's going to be quite frequent and can be very severe with angioedema. Epidemiology-wise, angioedema, it's hard to know the exact numbers, but it's believed to affect about 10 to 20 percent of the U.S. population at some point in a particular person's lifetime. This is excluding hereditary and acquired angioedema, which I've chosen kind of not to focus on since I have just a short, limited time today. Chronic idiopathic angioedema um, seems to involve females more than males, and then African Americans are more susceptible to ACE inhibitor um, induced angioedema, and the adjusted relative risk is thought to be three to four and a half. Um, as far as age is concerned, angioedema can really affect um, a wide age range, um, children all the way up to adults. Kids are going to um, most often have angioedema that's associated with allergic reactions, like the food um, or ingestions. ACE inhibitor associated angioedema generally occurs, obviously, with those that are taking ACE inhibitors. So this is going to be an older population, your hypertensive adults, so around the 60-year-old age. Um, and then idiopathic angioedema, as we spoke of, occurs most often in females. And then it's going to be in the 30 to 15 age range. I know you guys know this one already, but just for completeness sake, um, angioedema that's acute is going to be anything that lasts less than six weeks. And then it um, turns to be the chronic classification if it's occurring most days of the week um, for more than six weeks. We've kind of alluded to this already as far as pathogenesis. Uh, it occurs with the venules and capillaries that become leaky in response to inflammatory mediators such as bradykinin and histamine. These vascular or inflammatory 
mediated cause a loss of vascular integrity um, by dilation and increased permeability of the vascular surface. Uh, there are three known causes or subgroups of angioedema. <coughs> your mast cell mediated, bradykinin mediated, and those that are idiopathic or of unknown mechanism. With your mast cell mediated angioedema, um, the activated mast cells are what re these inflammatory cytokines, um, and some of those cytokines include histamine, heparin, leukotriene C4, and prostaglandin D2. Uh, common types of mast cell mediated processes include your IgE dependent allergic reactions, so like to food, singing, <laughs> that kind of thing, latex. Um, then you have direct mast cell release. There are certain muscle relaxants, such as the, the phenylcholine and curare, um, that mediate mast cell release directly. And then um, finally, your aspirin and your NSAIDs. And here, um, this is perturbations in arach arachidonic acid metabolism. Um, and NSAIDs that inhibit COX-1, of course, um, mediate the in generation of prostaglandins from um, arachidonic acid within the mast cells and the lipocytes. So here, um, you have, when you're taking these medications, increased formation of pro-inflammatory pro cytokines leading to angioedema in certain in individuals. Moving on to your bradykinin-mediated pathway, um, here, rather than mast cells being the um, culprit, um, bradykinin is an inflammatory mediator that leads to beta cell dilation and um, increased permeability. Bradykinin is not generated by the mast cells, and here mast cells are really not involved. What I wanted to focus on with this slide is how ACE inhibitors cause angioedema because it's one of the bradykinin associated forms of angioedema. And again, I had to take it back to med school. Um, ACE is an enzyme that really has two main effects. One is converting angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, and the other effect is bradykinin breakdown. So if you're taking a medication that inhibits this enzyme, of course you're going to have um, both of those actions being prevented. Thus, with increased circulating bradykinin, vessels are, again, going to become leaky, um, allowing for angioedema to occur. And then finally, your etiologies of unknown uh, mechanism, idiopathic angioedema sits there. And this is recurrent episodes of angioedema without urticaria, and once you've ruled out any other etiology, such as allergy or drug reaction. Also, calcium channel blockers fibrinolytics, and then really some other herbals are known to cause angioedema, and at this point we don't really have an etiology for that. Clinical manifestations, I only chose this slide just because it shows a pretty um, clinically significant case of angioedema. This is the same female. Um, are going to be um, angioedema, like we talked about, is uh, non-pyritic and generally non-pitting edema, unlike the edema that's edema that's associated like heart failure or your liver disease. Um, the area of involvement is most often skin colored to maybe just mildly erythematous, and depending on the area of swelling, the pain can be absent or pretty, pretty severe. Um, specifically talking about some of the areas that are often, often um, um, involved, your larynx first, early symptoms are going to include voice, hoarse voice, throat tightness, and dysphagia, and this can include progress on to um, the feeling of your throat closing all the way off in respiratory distress. With your skin and mucous membranes, again, the um, skin may be normal in color, it may be mildly erythematous, and then there's the pain and warmth that may be present. This is typically going to be less severe than your pain and warmth that's associated with like the cellulitis type picture. Um, skin fault, skin findings. Um, generally resolved without any residual markings with angioedema, unless urticaria are present, and then you have lots of scratching and exploration, and there may be some scarring. And then finally, your bowel wall involvement um, consists of colicky abdominal pain, sometimes with nausea, vomiting, and maybe even diarrhea. And you're going to um, see bowel wall involvement most, most often with the bradykinin-mediated angioedema. Moving on to your management, um, acute management, of course, is going to be um, airway, ABCs is a priority. So if this is an ER patient, that's kind of where you're going to um, um, have your focus at initially. Subsequently, obtaining a good history and physical is going to be very key as angioedema is most generally a clinical diagnosis. So you're going to want to ask about all those things listed below, any new exercise, what the patient has re uh, recently ingested, any family history. Um, 
any unexplained abdominal pain in the past, those kind of questions. Moving on to the physical exam, we have already really talked about what you expect to see there. If there are no other signs of symptoms of mast cell activation, so no urticary or things of that nature, then that may lead you to think more of a bradykinin-mediated pathway like ACE inhibitors. Um, and then moving on after your physical exam, of course, will be your laboratory. Um, suspected allergies can be worked up and diagnosed, and you can screen with blood or skin test, um, with the caveat being that you want that acute um, disease process to be completely um, resolved before we do any skin testing. And all new onset patients, um, you can consider those labs noted there, so CBC, BMP, LMPs, um, inflammatory markers, and then your complement. And um, this is going to be up to your clinical judgment. Um, you don't necessarily have to order all of those lab tests, but those are ones that you would want to consider. And then the workup for patients um, with isolated mucosal or cutaneous enogeodema um, without any urticaria or anything of that nature, um, would you'd be more likely to do like C1 inhibitor um, screening tests, so your C1 level and a C4 level as well. Moving on to um, treatment, the goal of treatment obviously is to prevent swelling. Antihistamines are going to be the first line, like with urticaria, um, and then excuse me, corticosteroids can be considered for very severe cases. If this is angioedema associated with an allergic reaction, of course you're going to want to use your epi as always. Tricyclics also have some um, H1 blocking properties as well. For bradykinin mediated pathways, which I didn't specifically focus in on because it's kind of just a group of its own, um, the histamines really aren't going to work and there's a whole other line of treatment for that. Um, and this is just a short slide on differential diagnosis. So with your skin findings, again, thinking about cellulitis, autoimmune diseases, um, SVC syndrome, and hypothyroid. When the larynx is what's involved, you also should consider things like tonsillitis, abscess, and foreign body, and then your other causes of bowel wall edema. So again, in your older patients, thinking about like vasculitis or infarction, um, IBD sometimes as well. Um, Complications of angioedema, of course, the most compli or most life-threatening com complication that you're going to worry about is that of a compromised airway. And so we've kind of already talked about, you know, ABC being number one. Intubation, intubation can be hard in these patients because of their um, difficult airways with all their edema, and the risk of vocal cord damage is very high in these patients just because of um, the alterations in their anatomy. The other um, concern for life-threatening illness is when angioedema is associated with anaphylaxis. So again, epinephrine is going to be key. And I did read um, kind of in preparing for this lecture that about 20, 10 to 25 percent of cases that present um, to the ED are thought to be life-threatening, so a pretty significant number. Um, other complications you can read there, the severe abdominal pain and bowel obstruction with pancreatitis, and then there are even some reports of skin rupture. Um, the prognosis for angioedema really depends on the underlying etiology. Um, Generally, allergic and medication-induced angioedema do very well once the inciting agent is kind of identified and removed from the picture. Um, with idiopathic angioedema, it's harder to know, and there, of course, is much more variable. It could run weeks, um, up to years, and then even a small number of patients um, can run for years and years, so decades. But that's rare. And that's my presentation. Thank you guys oh, for listening. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. The one thing I would, uh, the only one caveat I would say is C3 used to be uh, drawn all the time, mm -hmm. and that's sort of gone by the yeah, way. Yeah, I'm not sure everyone just draws the C4. C4. Okay. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you very much. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.